So um, this is the last talk today, um, and I apologize if I um, run over there with the time. It's very lengthy. I just packed it full of stuff. Um, and if you have any questions, please ask. But if anything in depth, like ask me at the end. Um, so this talk is about abusing the Go um, net package for fun and profit, something that we've been doing a lot here at Improbable. Um, and here's a quick outline of what we're going to be talking about. So for all you Go wizards that actually know how all the internals of the stuff works, like there's beer. Um, if anyone else needs a little bit of an introduction, we're going to go through the uh, like typical things you are uh, exposed to if you ever want to touch on things, but on every single one of them we're going to talk about a case of abuse. Um, so we're going to be talking about the net package, the typical things you touch, the dialer, the listener, the column, um, then we're going to be talking about the net HTTP package, probably the uh, superstar of all the Go packages, um, everyone heard about it, um, there's some naughty stuff inside. Um, and then we're going to touch on HTTP2. So it's going to be like a little bit of a segue into networking if anyone's interested. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, this is my GitHub handle. Uh, I'm Michal. That's how I pronounce my name. I take my call as well. Uh, so I'm a principal engineer here in Improbable. I've committed many heinous crimes in our code basis. Um, nowadays, I mostly code in Gmail, uh, which is not coding, unfortunately. Um, I was a Google SRE for a wee while, um, not anymore. Um, I do really like next gen, next gen tech, and a lot of it is going to be like how we kind of hijack Go and run with it. Um, and I really like coffee. Um, so yeah, just a disclaimer, I haven't really coded much recently. Um, nature of my job changed, and I've been busy in my private life, but it should be still current. And there's a bunch of stuff in the open world that all the jolly good people here from Improbable have been maintaining since. So yeah. OK, so let's dive. So the first package we're going to be talking about is the net package, the thing that actually makes the pipes that make up the internet. Um, as everyone knows, the internet is a series of pipes. <laughs> so the net con is basically the closest thing you'll find to a pipe. So it's an interface, so it's great because you can do nasty things with interfaces. You, the nice thing about Go is that it's very composable. If there's ever an interface, you can basically substitute it for something else, which is why con is so nice. Um, the primary things to care about is the read, write, and close, not no flush. Flush is a separate thing, totally optional, just, you know, most things have it, but something's done. The next thing is not really a type, but it's a convention. Um, so a lot of the internals of the Go packages take this kind of signature, which is also the signature of the dial context function of the standard net dialer. And basically, all of the net code in Go you encounter takes something like this. And it's nice because, well, it's a function signature. And you can splice something else in, and it returns the net con, which means you can inject your own interface. Next is the net listener, which is kind of the server side bit of the pipe. And again, the interesting function here is the accept method, which returns another con, which means that it's also prone to inject nasty st stuff in. So every single thing that you will ever listen on in a Go server, will basically implement this. This is the really nice thing about Go. Everyone seems to be sticking to the standard types. It's not like Java with its own magical streams and stuff. Like, you know, um, it's actually all this. So, the first case for abuse is how about we do tunneling over HTTP? So, how many of you know how HTTP proxies work? And show hands. Cool. How many of you know how SSL over HTTP proxies work? Okay. So what it actually what actually happens is when you have an HTTP proxy configured in your browser, um, you actually 
do a HTTP connect method to that proxy, which then establishes a TCP connection to the destination server. And from that point on, you just get a TCP connection because obviously if it was terminating your SSL on the proxy, it would be a very, very, very beautiful place to put a man in the middle of an attack. So they don't. Basically, once the connect handshake is done, you get a bi-directional TCP stream all the way to the other side, proxy it through this little server in the middle, which was intended to be used for SSL, but you can put whatever you want in it. You can put SSH, you can put ISC, or other nasty things that we put through it, if you ever use that tag. Um, so here's an example. So I wrote a little bit of a like a package called HTTP dialer, which substitute the dialer interface that we've seen before for something that does the HTTP connect um, handshake and returns your TCP netcon to the server behind it. So in this example, we do an HTTP dialer new through my proxy, which also, by the way, can be over SSL because nice composability of uh, Go. Um, we indicate what server we want to dial on the other side, and then we just connect. And at this point, we have a netcon, which is a TCP, write, read, any, whatever you want, even a flusher. So what do we do with it? Like, how about we do an SSH handshake through it and establish like an interactive SSH session with the beauty of the crypt SSH, which actually is a remarkably cool package, by the way, but not a topic here. Um, so, you do a uh, new client on SSH, you pass it a con, there is a nice dial method here, but it doesn't take a dialer, so it'd be kind of like, you have to pass it explicitly. Um, you then do a new client and get a session, and from this point on, congrats, you have an interactive SSH session over an HTTP proxy. Who would have thought? Talking about intended purpose, why not? Cool. Another case for abuse. So. If you're using Go for networking of any way, of any, of any shape, um, you probably also use it on the front-end side. And if like us, you actually terminate the um, connections from clients directly in Go, you may see things like connections hanging around for a little bit, like some weird stuff from load balances or whatnot. And a lot of the times, you would then to troubleshoot well, why do I see all my Go servers running out of file descriptors? You would be SSH into the box and doing like netstat and be like, <laughs> tons of stuff. So, why do I need to SSH into a box? That's, that's just stupid. Um, so, there is a little nifty package called Contract, which allows you to do connection tracking of all outbound and inbound connection to your Go server by injecting itself into the interfaces that we've seen before. So this is an example where your server, as it calls out to an external anything really, um, through the default HTTP transport, tracks all the unbound connections, keeps track of them somehow. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, and also, you can pass it some interesting information into, in the context. So the one thing that I failed to mention before is that the dial, uh, dial with context actually passes on the context and it's the same context you will be passing to an HTTP method. So if you want to add some method into it, cool, the tracker will keep track of it. Next. You also can track inbound connections since the listener actually can return you an arbitrary netcon of any type you want. Why not return your own netcon? So in this case, we have a typical listener code like netlisten tcp8080 because 80 is privileged and didn't be bothered. Um, so you do contract listener, wrap this guy, and when it actually accepts a new connection, it's wrap it into another struct and keep track of it. So this way, everything that enters the server on this port will be tracked under this HTTP bucket. You're probably all wondering what this tracing thing here is in here. So this actually gives you the really nice start thing. So 
How many of you have heard of the um, XNet trace package in Go? So, very few people. It's actually really cool. Um, it's kind of what a lot of Google services have internally. They have a lot of internal debug um, like servlets or Go handlers that allow you to inspect the state of the binary. So, XNet trace has a bunch of those things and it has two key features. One is events, so things that are ephemeral and lost, last a long time, and requests for, well, requests. Um, in this case, an event is an open connection. In, you can see that we have client-con, which is outbound connections from the server, and server-con, the inbound connections to the server. As you can see, you can, in, this, is, this is not really a great example, but like, it comes from local host. If it was coming from somewhere else, it would be really not, much nicer. But at this point, we actually accepted a connection to 1990 from this client uh, port. Um, and you can see the full trace, how it was actually connected and how it got to this listener, which is really handy if you have more than multiple listeners in your own binary and you have multiple ports so you can actually see uh, what's going on. The other nifty thing it does is it does Prometheus stuff. Um, so we use Prometheus a lot. and um, actually instrumenting your binaries to see how many connections there are inbound and outbound from your binary is very, very useful if you have any um, TCP leaks. In this case, it's actually a, an aggregation that we have in Prometheus because, well, aggregations are good because they help you actually serve graphs in a timely fashion. Um, but it shows you how many outbound connections our um, Elasticsearch proxying server has to our Elasticsearch cluster. So you can see it oscillates between three and six, and that's because HTTP one sucks. But uh, more on that topic later. Cool. Any questions so far? This was the really nice and very simple net package before we delve into the beast. Any questions so far? Nope. Cool. So the net HTTP package which is probably the thing that most people get exposed to when they touch code for the first time because Hello World is no longer the thing that most people write. It's just some HTTP server um, because it's really easy in Go. Um, but most people then just write wrappers and tons of other external libraries around this and whatnot. But what we're going to do is actually look at the internals and the low, like the kind of standard types that it has in order for to make like other things that we abuse it for are kind of clearer. So apologies for repetition. You probably all know this, guys. Uh, so I try to extract most of the interesting bits out. Um, so HTTP request, which is a magical hybrid of client-side and server-side code. And it has so many things, so many methods, and so many fields that I didn't bother putting it on the slides. Um, so I decided to go with the interesting quirky stuff, the host field. Don't trust it. It's not really what you're thinking it is. Um, most of the stuff that you want on the client side is in the URL field. And if you happen to write your own header file with host in it, what will happen depends on the particular Go version, so never do that. Um, Good day. It's actually a relatively new introduction in, I think, 1.8, um, which allows you to, for example, let's say you are uploading a file and the receiving server tells you like, hello, but I don't want this. Please, please upload it somewhere else. You get a redirect. So GetBody allows you to provide a function which will reset your input stream to the beginning and upload it from there. Really handy if you have a big file and you don't want to keep it all in memory. Um, trailer. So trailer is a really interesting, interesting, nifty thing. A lot of people don't know that HTTP 1.1 has trailers. Um, HTTP 2 does, but HTTP 1.1 also has. Um, and it's actually quite nifty and useful for purposes at the very, very end of the presentation, so I'm going to leave it out for now. Um, the other one is TLS connection state. So you're like, OK, but this is my request. Why would I have a connection-based object in it? Like, it makes no sense. That's connection scope. This is a request scope. What the hell? Um, Actually, it's remarkably useful, but only if you're on the server side. But it's the same type, but never mind. Um, so this is really useful if your HTTP handler wants to 
validate the connection credentials of the client in the handling code. If, for example, you wanna, you did a TLS connection that is mutually authenticated and your client presented some sites to your server, you may want to extract the details out of that or you wanna check or show a warning or throw an error if they're calling with an old deprecated TLS uh, version. Yep, you can do it here. Actually working with the connection state is absolutely, absolutely horrid. If anyone tried that, yep, terrible. Um, but the other thing that is extremely useful in the request object, and I who here hasn't heard of the context object, context type? Everyone heard of it? Yeah, cool. It is probably the best thing in Ghost and Slash Bread. Um, it actually allows you to scope everything that happens to your request and anything that you would do as part of your request handling to the inbound request. So previously, if you had to work with the cancel func of request, yeah, not great. Um, this does it automatically. You can call a database query, you can call an external service with another HTTP request, you can even like, I don't know, like go to space. Um, it will all be scoped to the same request and everything will be cancelled together. It's great. It also allows you to pass arbitrary strings and other types as well, which is <laughs> great for abuse. Um, so this weird thingy is both some, so, so, some of the fields and some of the methods are used on the server side, some of them are used on the client side, some of them are used for both. Um, which one it is, you just need to like figure out in practice because the documentation does really tell you that much. Cool, the HTTP response, and you'd be thinking that this is the same as the HTTP request, but it's not because this one is just a client, client side one, they just confuse you. Um, so the one thing that always trips people whether you use Go for the first time is this doesn't really give you the, the all the stuff that you would expect from the server just returns to you immediately after you handle the uh, request and then it gives you this nice nice body. So the only thing that it has is the headers of the response, the status code and all the other stuff and after that you do the body thing. Now most people probably get tripped by the body IO closer. So let's say you have a modern HTTP server like supporting 1.1 and you happen to have this really nifty feature called Keep Alive which allows you to reuse the connection after you serve the request for another request. Yeah, you can't if you happen to not read all of this and close the body. Like the internals of Go will not let you do it. It will establish a new connection and just ka-ching. Uh, no great. Content length? What if, what, like, show of hands, who knows what this is? Who knows when it returns zero? When? Yep, cool, <laughs> good reading. Um, yeah, so it also returns zero if it's a head request, but it, who heard of chunked responses? Cool, so for those of you who haven't, it allows you to um, the server to return an unknown length of a response. It doesn't have to be a file with like, yeah, 700 gigs. It's like, okay, here's some data, here's some data, here's some data, here's another chunk with some prefix length. And Go is really nice because it understands everything here, except for the fact that your content length is zero and your reader then just does all the magic. But also, it gives you the trailers. The dimension trailers, the trailers are useful for the stuff at the end. Cool. Now we get to the daddy of all the HTTP packages, the response writer. And it's literally the weirdest thing in the universe. Um, it has just three methods, and it's probably the most commented thing I've seen in the Go code base. Each single one of them has four paragraphs which tell you the really quirky things about how it really works in weird cases of when you're using this particular protocol, or this particular protocol, or this particular case in this particular pro protocol. Um, it is really weird. And the weirdest thing, it actually has, it's only useful if you use it in, a com like in conjunction with those interfaces. So a lot of the objects that implement those response writers also inter implement those four um, additional interfaces. So the hijacker, if you get a response thing that allows your handler to respond to an HTTP request, 
the hijacker allows you to then just yank the TCP connection out from the Go stack and do nifty stuff with it yourself, like, for example, start an SSH session or handle a web socket, uh, which is the primary use case. Um, then you have the HTTP pusher, and it sounds like a generic thing, but it only works if you're using HTTP2. Uh, cool. The flasher, yeah, because obviously people implement um, implement HTTP servers over things that don't have a flush interface because your netcom doesn't have a HTTP interface, so the response writer can't have a flush in it. So there is an additional interface you can use to flush bytes to your client in chunks, for example. And the close notifier, which if you didn't use context, allows you to add the function when the inbound connection closes. Cool. So how it all ties together. So this is probably the most commonly, like every single person who did it like a hello world and a go web server would see this. So it's the handler funk. It takes a response writer. I mean, you have no clue what this is, but for some odd reason, this is a pointer to a struct, and this is an interface. Whoa. So this is the only canonical way of writing HTTP handling code in Go. And every single magical framework that you've ever encountered for Go boils down to this, except for the fast HTTP, which is a completely different beast, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. So this interface has become significantly more useful um, since Go 1.7. A lot of those frameworks were adding additional things that you could pass around in your uh, in your handlers, like your route that you were like routing through from your router, your logger, your whatever. But now you don't have to because your context is in the request, so you can attach whatever you want in it and abuse it for whatever you want. So. I was talking about frameworks, and the primary reason why people write frameworks is so they can avoid repetition when they write the kernel HTTP uh, service. Like, show of hands, who is using, like, Jim? No. What actual frameworks do you guys use, like, for HTTP? Gorilla Mox. Sorry? Gorilla Mox. Gorilla Mox, okay. That's one. Anything else? Chi. Chi, cool. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. Um, <laughs> what else? No, cool. Wow, that is a surprisingly narrow. Um, what was the thing that we were using that was terrible? Echo. Echo, yeah. Screwed up. Um, so, G has a really nice uh, interface. So, actually, not an interface, a type for defining middleware. It is so succinct yet so powerful. It is a funk from a handler to a handler. It may sound confusing, but it's actually very, very beautiful. So it's literally a recursive wrapper over handlers, which allow you your wrapper to do stuff to the handler before it executes and after it executes. Um, so you can basically colonize a lot of things like logging, monitoring, tracing, like open trace or like the debug request stuff, um, if you want to. So. This is precisely what we did in Go HTTP OS. We wrote a ton of really useful stuff for ourselves and now for others. Um, so this is an example. So you take a chi chain, Jesus, um, chi chain um, that first of all um, it does what we call context tags. So this is kind of like a thing that pulls out common information from the request and allows you to have like a nice kind of key value access to it. Um, so you can then easily print it in your debug handlers for debug requests page. You can easily attach it to your open trace metadata. You can then also use it to do Prometheus stuff. Did I say that we're using Prometheus here a lot? Um, and then you take this chain and you can apply it to any handler. So in this case, this is the standard HTTP package default serve mux, um, which is like Gorilla, but simpler and, yeah, just equally good. Cool. Who heard of this? Cool. Not many people. And this is probably the hidden gem of the HTTP package. Like, it actually is the inverse of the handler. It is the thing that 
every HTTP client sends a request down and returns a response. So this is literally an interface for implementing an HTTP transport. And did I mention it's an interface so you can like wrap it? Um, that's why I like it. All of HTTP client instances, including the default one, including the one that you, you get when you do HTTP.get or HTTP.post. By the way, never do that. Always have your own object. Always have your own HTTP client. Um, so there's only one real implementation, like for reals implementation in the Go package. Um, is the HTTP transport in the standard library. There's another one in XNet HTTP2, which I'm going to touch on in a second. Uh, but it is still an interface, so you can mock it, which is nice. And what do we do with it? Like, so following in the footsteps of G, we decided to implement the tripleware, which is basically middleware for outgoing stuff, because you obviously not only want to like do common stuff to the things that comes into your server, but you also want to do common stuff that goes out of the server. So what do you want to do with it? Like you do want to log your outbound requests. So for example, I don't know, you're calling external services and we're in the business of games and Steam doesn't always work. Um, so you want to log the requests you get from that, like all the errors you get from that, because it will, you will know that it's not you who's failing, it's the upstream service that's failing. You want to do monitoring for the same reason, tracing. Oh yeah, you can do retries as well because you get a weird error code. And if you know it's item button because it's a get ahead or something like that, why not? And equally debug requests. So, yeah, this is a really, really terrible screenshot, things in fun, but um, it literally shows you the primary reason why we've done both sides of the sandwich, so both the inbound requests and the outbound requests. So this is a screenshot of uh, Google uh, CloudTrace. Um, and you can use Zipkin or Jaeger or whatever other open source um, tracer you, you want to use. But it shows you an inbound request um, to demo a get RPC server. It took 63 milliseconds. Uh, yep, interesting. That then was making another get request, and then another get request. And so you can see the full trace of all the call stack. Like we have significantly more complex call graphs. I, I, I promise you that we just couldn't be bothered to put a good screenshot here. Um, but you can also do logging, which is really useful. This is the, this is the case I was talking about. So not only can you um, can you log the inbound request, which is the spans, span kind server? You can also log the outbound requests and the statuses that you receive and how long it took and stuff like that, which is extremely helpful for whoever goes on call in the middle of the night and they have no idea what the hell happened. So, cool. Any questions so far? No? Jesus, I missed through that. Like, wow. Um, okay. Who here? knows about HTTP2? Who here knows how it works? Okay, um, so significantly more people use it than understand it, which is understandable because it's not really easy. Um, so this is actually a really good approximation except for the fact that this should be like like multiple chunks. And yeah, anyway. Um, so in short, this is what HTTP2 is. Uh, so it is exactly the same semantics as HTTP 1.1, uh, which is it has its headers, it has its payloads, it has the same kind of like core patterns, the same methods, everything that you would expect. It's not really that much of a break and change. But the primary reason to use it is it allows you to multiplex stuff over the same connection. So with HTTP 1, you can use the same connection only after this response has finished. And only if you have Keep Alive, if you actually read the whole body, uh, you can do another request. Um, however, this is, means that if you actually want to fetch a lot of stuff at the same time, you're not in luck. You need to establish another connection to the server, send your request there, which means that you open up a lot of stuff and then close a lot of stuff and then open up a lot of stuff again, and it's like just terrible. Um, so with HTTP2, 
you can do your requests in a normal way, but then everything that you do over the connection is actually multiplexed. It has a concept of streams, and more importantly, all those streams are bidirectional. And like with HTTP 1.1, uh, where the only thing that you could have by direction, like, like streamable, is the server responses using the chunk response. With HTTP 2, you can just like, just I'm just going to chat to you, man, and you're going to chat to me, and it's going to be great. Like, basically, if this existed, WebSockets would never happen. Um, so the other nice thing of this is, like, you know, binary instead of text, that's actually a hindrance, unless you write in high-performance HTTP servers. Uh, but it has no head-of-line blocking. So you don't wait for the server to actually fetch the stuff from disk for this request until you can make another one. Unless you obviously lose a lot of packets and they just don't get there anyway. Um, so some no, no, no headline blocking, but yeah, still cool. So a lot of the advantages of HTTP 2 is the fact that it can actually run on the same port as your HTTP um, 1 server. And you don't really have to like think about, oh, yeah, I should be talking to that different port or that different port instead when I'm using HTTP 2. Um, and that's because. HTTP2 is designed to be uh, transparently upgradable, or not really transparently, but like without much hindrance, upgradable from HTTP 1.1. So there are two ways. Uh, for plain text collections, you can use the HTTP 1.1 upgrade method, uh, which is by itself has been invented for WebSockets, uh, but Go supports only one of them, which is the TLS 1.2 application layer protocol negotiation, AOPNN. So it sounds scary. It really isn't. If you're familiar in any way with TLS negotiation, what happens is the client says, like, hello, and the server says, hello. And during that, hello, hello, they can tell each other stuff. Like, for example, hello, I support those protocols. And the server says, yeah, cool. I'm gonna pick this one. Great. That that's all. Like literally, that that that's AOPN. Um, so, Go supports this magical negotiation transparently. And how is the topic of the next two really really hardcore slides? Because I'm gonna delve into how the internals of the HTTP transport work. Whoa, Jesus. Um, yeah. Sorry, that was <laughs> that took away the the whole thing. Um, so, you have your HTTP client. Um, if you again, if you're using the default HTTP client, the HTTP.get or HTTP.post method, please don't like just instantiate a client and then call a get on it. Underneath the covers, it's going to call the do method, which is a really well-defined method. Um, it's a cool name. Um, it takes the request and it passes it to the run trip interface, the thing that actually does the HTTP stuff. So the default implementation is the HTTP.transport. And the HTTP.transport is a beast because it does a lot of stuff. So the first thing it does, have you ever implemented any other protocol other than HTTP? Have you heard of Gopher protocol? Yeah, cool. So this is the bit that in the HTTP transport, someone just jammed in a way of calling an arbitrary other transport, because why not? So you can register a thing that will call Gopher or FTP over HTTP.transport. Like, OK. Still, cool. Um, then after it actually decides it's HTTP, um, it's great success, it goes and it's like, OK, so how do I call the URL that is in the request. How do I actually get that? So this is the internal method called getcon. And the getcon does two things. First, it consults the getidlecon. What do you think it does? Nope. <laughs> yes. And it has its own uh, idlecon tool. So when we're talking about keep lives, this is where idle connections after a keep alive request are actually stored. So if there's one free, it will just give it to you, and it's going to be quick, and it's going to be awesome. But if it's not, it will call dialcon. And dialcon is a beast by itself. It will do magical things. So in the simplest case, it's an HTTP connection direct to a server, and it will just call your dialfunk that you can customize from the thing that I talked about before. 
But if it's not, if it's, for example, you're sitting behind a proxy and you have like a proxy where environmental variable established, you will automatically detect that and will doubt through this, but they will fall back to that and will do a magical dance and like tip its hat and do magical things. I don't really want to talk about it. This is so complicated and convoluted. It's terrible. But the most other common case is it will check if your scheme of your URL is HTTPS instead of HTTP and pass over to the TLS dial. And TLS dial does everything that the TLS connection should do, which is check what are the trusted certificates I have, what kind of crypto stuff I can use to talk to the server, and guess what it does? It actually calls dial funk again underneath. Layers. Cool. So after we get the dial com, it will then say, you know what? I'm good. I can now handle this stuff. But HTTP has this magical function called redirect, so it's not just that easy, like you just don't call, it will automatically redirect for you. So this works in a loop and executes the HTTP round trip function itself. So it writes the request to the server, flushes it down, waits for the server to respond, returns your response uh, struct, and then gives you the reader for the, uh, for the body. Cool. So far so good? Simple? Cool. So imagine now you have to bolt onto this HTTP2 support. Like, like Brad Fitzpatrick was like, Ooh, the guy that wrote HTTP2 support for Go, is like, oh, where do I join this? And the answer to that is here. <laughs> so yeah, so as I was saying, uh, saying before, um, the way you detect that you're calling HTTP2 instead of HTTP1 is in the TLS layer. So the TLS layer has now an, ex like an additional field uh, which is just used for HTTPS and it has the TLS, ne TLS next proto. And the TLS next proto um, takes a map from name of protocol to an arbitrary function that does arbitrary things on the connection. So at this point, since you can't break the abstraction between TLS and HTTP, it couldn't be another round tripper. So it's an arbitrary function that then, then takes this protocol, this connection that it established, it will add it to this compo, but it will also add it to the default compo of the default com transport of the HTTP2 package, because that's the only way you can do it. Um, then returns, and the other thing that it attaches to the compo, that it uh, the, the com that it returns, is the dot out dot round trip function, which is Great, because this then calls the round trip method of the HTTP2 protocol on that thing. So that's how it gets negotiated. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to debug that shape. It's just mental. Um, so why am I even talking about it? So this is kind of like the advanced case of abuse. Um, the reason why I even introduced you to those graphs is because like, I wanted to make this pun with the round robin. Um, so the thing I mentioned before is the compo is using the request URL host part to decide which of the connections to reuse for this request. So let's say that you have to write a load balancer, and we actually kind of did that. So we have a project called Catch, which is the Kubernetes Edge server. Um, and this is a little bit of a segue, but it kind of shows why we did the crazy thing. Um, so we have a cluster, uh, which Stefan told you about. We have many clusters. Um, so you have one cluster with a private namespace, which is isolated from the other cluster, which has its own private networking and private namespace. And you want to call from this service to this service that you don't know about it. So it dials over the public internet using a well-named well -named DNS thingy. It terminates it at the catch, which is our Kubernetes edge server. And that edge server then needs to decide which of the ports of this server to send it to. And it has many because, you know, redundancy and just good practice. Um, so how do you load balance a HTTP request? with absolutely minimum effort, when you know the internals, but can't be bothered implementing like a lot of stuff around it. So you implement a round tripper because that's an HTTP transport. Um, you first read what kind of things you got from the resolution system, DNS or Kubernetes, or like your magical pixie dust. Um, 
you then call a pick function, which in this case is a round trip one, but it could be like you're always my victim number one. Um, and then you just overwrite the host of the URL and just pass it to the stack below. And lo and behold, it will maintain all of your connections for you. It will do all the stuff and just close them when it's necessary and cool, it works. It's a nice hack if you want to see the actual code. It's kind of like been extended and added monitoring and stuff like that, but yeah. Cool, so that's abuse case number one. So this is uh, the reason why I was talking about HTTP2. So we're heavy users of gRPC, and we have kind of abused the uh, beauty of composability of Go uh, to pull off this project, which kind of takes gRPC at some Golang blue and allows you to use that in a browser. So why? Because, well, gRPC is just HTTP2, but let's maybe start with what gRPC is in the first place. How many of you actually heard about gRPC? Cool. How many of you use it? OK, cool. So short introduction. gRPC is um, a tech that has been open sourced by Google like two years ago. It's a real implementation of the internal stuff that Google had. But long story short, you have a portal file that usually defines your port above messages, which are these guys, which is a binary representation of a struct uh, with some strong typing in it and introduces a, an interface which allows you to say hello using this message and gives you this response. So what it does, it actually has a ton of code generation for many languages. Like it supports Java, C++, it supports Go. Um, and it is the primary reason why we're using it as our transport layer because it talks multiple language, like to multiple languages and you don't really have to care about details. Um, so, how it works is actually it's backed by HTTP2. It is basically a nice top hat on top of the complexity of HTTP2. So, a normal HTTP GRPC request is this is the HTTP2 notation for stuff. So, a request is a method post using HTTP to this path, which is my component service slash say hello to this server. It has a timeout, which is nice because it's different. The content type is gRPC plus, plus portal. It's zipped. And the data stream of the HTTP2, which is your typical HTTP 1.1 payload, is just a bunch of length prefix put above messages. And in the response, first you get a 200, which is meaningless. Uh, but it just tells you that your Nginx didn't fuck up. Um, and then just tells you it's just content type gRPC plus portal. Some data streams, prefixed responses can be multiple response stream, like uh, protobufs, can be multiple client protobufs, it's cool. Uh, but the crux of the whole thing is in the trailers. Um, I was talking about trailers a lot, this is precisely why. Um, because your handling code doesn't really know, for example, my stream got truncated midway, but I already told you everything's okay. Oh, damn. That's why gRPC put the status of the handling of the method at the very end in the trailers. Um, so this indicates to the caller, yes, your RPC has been successfully completed. And literally this is the primary reason why you should use it over like REST plus JSON, because you know that you screwed up midway through. You can indicate that. You know how to differentiate between a screw up midway and a screw up on the connection. Cool. So, with that in mind, but you think like, yeah, but like modern browsers, they do HTTP2, and it's like, yeah, but you can access that HTTP2 thing using legacy Java, like JavaScript stuff that have been like introduced there in the Netscape times. So like, no, actually, it's better, but um, it doesn't really give you access to uh, trailers. And the reason why is even though HTTP 1.1 supported trailers, the, one, the only people that used the trailers were like um, content distribution networks to transfer files between each other. Like, browsers never used them, so they're not in the J JavaScript APIs. And what's more, even though you can post a thing, the browser expects you to have everything in your memory so it knows its length. So you can't really stream stuff up 
um, except if it's a file upload. Wait. So, GRPC Web is unofficial. It's actually been done by the guys, the good guys at Google, doing the GRPC stuff. We did the spec. Um, we did the implementation, by the way. Cool. Um, so, the official variant of GRPC that, well, it doesn't support client side streaming because browsers are dumb. And the other thing, it puts the GRPC status trailers inside the data stream. Sounds simple, right? Yeah, actually, in Go, it's fairly simple because GRPC Go has an experimental transport that allows you to make it into an HTTP.handler. Um, you can fake whatever you want into a response writer. And conveniently, the HTTP trailer support is just a hack. So you can read it in a really weird way. So that was very helpful. So this is literally how it works. Like that's basically most of the Go side code. There's a lot of TypeScript involved in the GRPC web project. But literally, it's like, I got a request. Cool. Is it a GRPC web request? Yeah. OK. Pretend to the GRPC implementation that is a normal GRPC call. OK. You get, let's fake out the response writer that does the thing of copying the trailers into the payload. Give it to the GRPC server. Write the payload, the trailers as payload. Job done. That is literally what it is. So this has been fairly popular. Uh, this project is like over 1,000 stars on GitHub. We've been using it in production. It's been like really cool. Um, so all of it because Go has a really, really nice abstraction over its types. You can compose it. You can hack it. And also has a beautiful hack with trailers. So to recap, Go's composition is awesome. Go's standard library is awesome, but it's also very complex. And think twice before you abuse it, but it's sometimes maybe worth it. So I'm going to leave you guys with those open source projects, the ones I actually mentioned, the HTTP download, the contract, Chai, which is awesome, the HTTP runs that we're going to be like announcing slightly later on, Kedge, which is not announced, but it's kind of open source, and GRPC web. That's all. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, so you mentioned GRPC Web, and uh, I'm, I'm aware you guys have an implementation in TypeScript, uh, but there's also an implementation in the official private repository, which was worked on for a while, but then kind of died down, but has now started work on again. Do you know what the status is of that project? So, um, yeah, they had some, um, they had some personal issues, um, but um, as far as I know, the, the kind of spec is relatively stable, and both implementations are actually going to be working on building a like like compatibility cross testing between that and this, and once they actually make that public, it will be testable both ways. So yeah, but they do have an implementation in um, in uh, whatever it's called. No, it's C++ with. Um, they're written in Nginx proxy. Yeah, an Nginx proxy and like a Node.js <coughs> kind of language. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not cool. Um, <laughs> any more questions? No. Great. Thank God. Let's drink. Cool. Thank you very much. Oh, sure, JavaScript like